episode 344. I think right now the biggest thing that we have to look at too that was brought up is Pedro just said, you know, plan on two hours. What do we all know? We all see a lot of us came from flat rate an hour. Oh, it's got a communication issue. It's an hour. You know, the hour day to me is gone. And I think that's, it seems simple, but that's really the starting point of it is when you're scheduling work, you need to understand that cars are not the same as they were in 1980 and they're not the same as they were in 1990 or even in 2000. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, aftermarketers, technicians, shop owners, and diagnosticians to episode 344 of Remarkable Results Radio. A standby for a technician roundtable with Bryn Klein, Tanner Brand, and Pedro Delatore. In this episode, we talk about the differences between ATEX and diagnosticians, and a whole lot more. This episode is presented by Federal Mogul Motor Parts. They are the reason you enjoy these great free aftermarket interviews. Now, when you need innovation and quality, you need Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Brands like Moog, Felpro, Wagner Brake, Anco, Champion, Seal Power, FP Diesel, and more. They're the parts text trust. Find out more at fmmotorparts.com and thank you for your support of these brands. I'll be hitting the road soon to attend industry events and I'll be moderating panels and recording interviews and we'll be presenting my keynote. Again this year, 2018, I'll be at Apex with my studio and will also lead a panel that you do not want to miss. Our topic at Apex is Automotive Career Pathways, the Road to Great Technicians. Keep an eye on the newsletter and the social streams for more information. If you're listening from your desktop and want to be mobile, you can find many options for your smart device at remarkableresults.biz slash app, so you can go mobile. Hey, the network of listeners builds in the aftermarket's learning superhighway. And I'm very honored to make so many connections, like new Facebook friends Dennis Blow, Jason Rizzou, Cheryl Anderson, Michael Grochala, and Chris Decker, and my new Instagram followers, AJ Neely and Padilla Angelina, and my latest LinkedIn connections, Derek Devers, Brett Bodis, and Lennox Hunter. Get connected. RemarkableResults.biz slash social. This technician roundtable includes Bryn Klein, AAM, owner of Assured Auto Works in Melbourne, Florida, Tanner Brandt from Tanner's Auto Clinic, and Pedro Della Torre from Logic Automotive, a mobile diagnostics training and consulting company. There's a diverse set of shops with A and B grade technicians and even heavy line technicians. These techs have their roles to fill and skills to showcase. Now, given this, it is a shop's responsibility to take advantage of each technician's given set of skills. They must fill the criteria of every shop's expertise, customer needs, and quality. This technician roundtable covers a lot of ground and points out that every tech must have that keen eye for detail when it comes to repairs. The panel says shops need to have the latest equipment and information technology updates to deliver quality customer service. Selling and scheduling diag time and constantly collecting data and case studies for future references are among the key talking points. Find those talking points and extended bios on my guests at remarkableresults.biz slash E344. Bryn, Tanner, and Pedro are passionate about their professional craft. This episode will pay dividends for all shop owners, service advisors, technicians, and diagnosticians in the aftermarket. Now be a fly on the wall in this roundtable discussion. Enjoy. Hey, a warm welcome to everyone. Um, and who's with me today? Oh, my friend Bryn Klein. Hi, Bryn, owner of Assured Auto Works. How you doing? Hey, Carm. Thanks for having oh, us. Oh, I, I met you. I met you in Orlando just a few weeks back. It was just great to spend some some time with you at the the big ASA event down there. And and thank you so much for coming on and doing a one on one podcast with me in episode two ninety three. And uh, Tanner Brand, technician, trainer, and owner of Tanner's Auto Clinic. Hey, Tanner. Hi, Carm. Thanks for having me. Is this your second time on? It is. I thought so. So glad to have you back. I have two alumni with me. You did a uh, an academy. Yeah. And also, I'd like to welcome Pedro Delatore, ASE Master Automotive Tech, L1 certified, and 
brand new owner of Logic Automotive, a mobile diagnostic owner. And here's the big secret. It's his first day of his own business. Congratulations, man. Thanks, yeah. Carm. I'm excited to be here. Uh, we're going we're gonna to look back at this day and we'll, we'll celebrate. Uh, maybe, maybe in a year we'll have a glass of wine over this. I think what we want to do is get together today and, and talk about the role of the diagnostician in, in the shop. And, and I think there's a lot to learn from both the techs that are going to listen to this and, and the shop owners. And this is strictly and only from the technician's perspective. Even though Bryn and Pedro and Tanner, you know, your trainers, your writers, and you're doing all of that stuff, I almost call you, you know, super diagnostic guys because I know you eat, breathe, and sleep this thing. I mean, you know, the story goes that you guys are talking at 2 o'clock in the morning and the wife wants to know what you're doing and you tell them you're just watching the news. Is that true? How do you get away with that? My wife's asleep at 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> thankfully. So uh, that's how I get away with it. No, I mean, I come home from work and we spend, I think most of us here are the same. We spend time, two or three hours, uh, helping put the kids to bed and, uh, you know, bathing them and all that. And then uh, once that's all done, spend a little bit of time with the wife and when she goes to sleep, uh, we decide we can't sleep. We've got to figure out cars and talk talk uh talk shops so that's that's how it goes down often times or research cars you know yeah try to catch up on the day from everything that's gone on in the chat or vox or messages or whatever other way that we all use to communicate i'm lucky enough my fiance's a she's pretty accepting of it so far so i'm real fortunate in that she doesn't really say too much to me so far i've been married 41 years guys and um tanner the only advice i could give you is do good training now so you don't have to worry about it later <laughs> <laughs> sounds good yeah. uh, you know what i mean Bryn? <laughs> yeah yeah so the role of the technician or the diagnostician really diagnostics is, is yeah I, I just want to share with everyone i we, we get into the virtual studio and these guys are talking geek to me and you know it's amazing what it takes to fix a vehicle today well to be at the top of your field it takes a huge commitment and really it takes a passion just a love for it you know i think uh you know you can get by and do okay but if you want to be you know at the top of your field, you definitely have to have a love for it because there is, uh, it's a never ending uh, learning experience, basically. What's tough for right now with it is the amount of training that it takes to be involved in the industry right now, the amount of drive it takes, and just the overall time, I guess, away, the commitment that it takes in to be a successful diagnostic tech, you really have to stay up on that. To be uh, I guess I would, I don't want to say just a shop owner is, you know, make it look like it's not a good thing or that it's easy, but to do mechanical repair work, there's a lot less that goes into it as far as training and as far as tooling and as far as just kind of everything that it takes to be involved in the diagnostic side of it right now. Bryn, you said the word love. You just got to love it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. When I think of uh, a shop owner, as I listen, I got to hire an A tech, uh, diagnostic tech, whatever that means, guys. Okay, let's assume that it means high level, high level person. Is one of the barometers, Bryn, when you want to hire a high tech, do you want to find that he loves, loves, loves to do this work? Yeah, if you're lucky. But that's kind of how this 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 conversation started. Um, Tanner, Pedro, and I were talking about it, and Tanner and Pedro specifically were. were in a position to where they found something, they found a shop that was looking for that quote, a tech and which, you know, someone that's focuses on the diagnostics of the shop. And they felt like they had a good opportunity to get into that position. And what we're finding is too often shop owners don't understand what it means to have a diagnostic tech. And uh, that's a lot of where this conversation, I think what you'll find uh, it steers from is uh, from their experiences, their um, we're finding in the field, like I said, that shop owners, we're hoping that kind of share what some of the behind the scenes stuff is and some uh, to share some of the value of a, of a true diagnostic technician. Because uh, just like we talk about um, acquisition of new talent into the industry, you can't put them under car changing oil every day and sweeping floors and taking out the trash for six months to a year. You have to give them something to be interested in. This is very similar for a diagnostic technician. For somebody that has literally invested uh, most of their days uh, researching cars and learning and attending training and, and networking with some of the best in the industry and making those uh, relationships and, and building and honing their skills, you can't expect that diagnostic technician to be the same 
uh, same uh, job description or uh, if you will, I guess, my lack of a can't think of a better way of saying it, but you can't expect that technician, that diagnostic technician to have the same roles in the shop that you can, uh, you know, maybe your line tech, your production tech or your, you know, so that's where a lot of this, is, this uh, has come from, I think is, you know, we're hoping to share uh, with technicians and shop owners, you know, what that role really looks like and try to build value for that. Well, you just mentioned job descriptions. Let's go there. I think right now the big thing is a lot of these shops really don't understand the difference between an ATEC and a diagnostic tech. And that's something that the term diagnostic tech you hear thrown around a lot at training conferences. But in the rest of the industry, I feel like a lot of people really have never heard it. And then they get kind of confused. They, you know, I get a lot of interviews, especially right now as I'm, you know, branching off right now and talking with shops, they go, oh, well, you know, you're a diag tech as I'm handing out business cards. Why don't you just come work for me? You do, you know, you'll do transmissions and head gaskets and everything else. Right. And I'm like, you know, I do, but that's not what I'm, you know, that's not why I'm here and that's not what I want to do, nor is that why I've spent so much money going to training. Uh, The message is don't stereotype an individual who is a diagnostic tech and assume that he's going to take on those different mechanical style roles. Yes. It's a different breed. You know, definitely you can have a talent to troubleshoot. Not to say that um, an R&R guy can't troubleshoot. I think they have a different type of troubleshooting, Uh, but you definitely have a different mentality. You know, you have a different approach. It could be a young individual that ex- that could excel in an IT field or something like that. And if they apply that troubleshooting and knowledge with computer systems into automotive, they would be a great fit. Uh, you know, a lot of it comes from that nowadays with what we're dealing with uh, automotive industry. The other night we were all talking, you know, Pedro and I were both in the same boat where we took a job at shops that thought they wanted a diag tech in our role was to diagnose vehicles. But a lot of shops think they have a ton of vehicles that need to be, you know, diagnosed and that they're going to take a lot of hours. And then you get somebody in that role that is proficient and is trained and has the tools to do it. And those cars tend to not take as long. I mean, you'll still get some cars now and then that are going to kick our butt for sure. And, you know, those cars may take long, like we were talking about when we got on, but you kind of end up running out of work and then those shops start looking at you like, okay, well, why am I paying you so much? You're standing around, you know, why are you not doing anything? But they don't really have an idea in mind when you come there of what else you're going to do besides diagnose cars. I guess that's kind of where the trouble becomes of then most of our group. I mean, there's five people right now just in our close net group that have made you know jump ship and are going mobile within the next couple months because they've had this issue and they kind of don't know what else to do the shops you know i know pedro said that he kind of got picked on a little bit and you know i've experienced that too that they kind of look at you and they're like well you don't really want to do mechanical stuff well i've done transmissions and head gaskets and everything else my entire life since i've been in it i've just kind of decided that i don't really want to do that stuff and i don't really feel i guess that i have a need to do it at this point guys i can only think of this it's the specialty uh, that doctors would go into you know a general practitioner versus uh, i'm going to be a brain surgeon or you know or a urologist or you know a cardiologist that's what i'm going to do so don't ask me to go in and do a general physical but i'm going to talk to you about your heart i'm a diagnostician and and I guess the whole point about that you mentioned is kind of it's coming to light for me is that there's a job description specifically for that role. And it's not that we're not team players. I mean, I think most of us uh, individuals that I communicate and talk with, you know, we're not against uh, doing whatever it needs to help the team uh, excel and succeed. But again, you know, we've invested a lot of time and money to get to where we are. We know what direction we want to go. We don't want to basically be typecast is the guy that just puts out fires for every, every aspect of every day. Um, not that that's obviously that's one thing that we want to discuss too, is, you know, to try to build value with that diagnostic technician and Tanner kind of alluded to that. Um, some of these jobs may not be, you may, you know, I think Pedro was talking before your shop was scheduling five or six, uh, diagnostic appointments. Wasn't that Pedro? Yes. Sometimes, 
And sometimes he would get done maybe early afternoon or mid afternoon. And so he would get that kind of impression that there was some animosity there, I guess. I like, maybe I'll let you tell that story if you want, but you know, that's for the nickname or, or the word easy money, you know, will get tossed around and it's, it's not really easy. Cause let's say you're expecting that car the next day, right? I could be up two hours, you know, the night before getting educated on it. That's kind of behind the scenes. Not everybody sees that. And that's why when you come in, there might be a perception, oh, wow, that was too easy for him or something. But a lot goes behind that. And on that same point, though, let's say you do finish early. There's a lot of roles that a diagnostic technician uh, can fill. For example, one thing that I think is crucial is quality control. Uh, if you get caught up with your work, I think that anybody that excels in diagnostics uh, has a keen sense of uh, detail, that they can pay attention to detail. And if you can follow up with shop uh, repairs that are completed, maybe test drive them, make sure that they're ready, you know, for the farewell with the customer, then the, that's a good thing for the shop. You know, that's a quality control at all times. Uh, you know, you, you diagnose a vehicle, it's a heavy repair. Once it's done, it comes back to you before it's released. Uh, and, and again, quality is maintained. And then there's so much more behind that. You know, you could have apprentice uh, techs that come in uh, and they can shadow you even one, one hour a day. If that's all they give you, they're preparing the next guys in line. Uh, to uh, get the same kind of quality work that you, that you can produce, hopefully. And that's that's key. I mean, I just listened to a great episode uh, with Dave uh, McCulch. Yeah, Mackles, yeah. We, I mean, we've talked and you've talked on the podcast about it, uh, you know, mentoring type thing that the industry needs to um, take on more of, at least in a formal way. And that's a perfect example. We talk about, you know, making sure that shop owners see the value in the diagnostic technician besides just diagnosing cars. And that's what Pedro's trying to, um, or Pedro did so well as explaining is that we have other things that we can do to help that, that team excel. I'm talking to Bud Houston, a technical product specialist with Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Do you actually put products in the hands of the technicians? Yes, absolutely. Anytime there's new product introduced, perhaps a new problem solver or a new technology, uh, we keep that stuff on the van just because uh, their local parts supplier may not have it available. And we think it's important to show them what's coming. And then seeing the part is really, especially with the new OEX, seeing the part and touching the part is something that changes perspective rather than just a piece of paper with a picture of the part. Okay, so you put an OEX pad into the hand of a technician, and you've done this, I'm sure, hundreds of times. What do you see on their face when they see it? You can, you can tell they get it. You know, in, in, in our industry, there's technology that, that we use all the time that you look at, and you're like, that just doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to take your word that it works. You put an OEX brake pad in somebody's hand, and I just ask the question, why does this look so weird? And they're like, I bet it's to make it cool. They get it as soon as you put it in their hand. So technicians holding your product and listening to your presentation, do you ever see the light bulbs go up? They raise their hand and says, boy, I've got a great idea for you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Not only do, do, does that happen, every time I'm with a group of guys, I solicit ideas. I'm like, listen, a lot of the stuff that I've shared with you originated in a bay somewhere where the technician said, you know what, if you could do this, it would be really cool. And so the stuff that I get, I send up you know, uh, to our engineering team and say, hey, could we do something like this? And there's things in, in the works and there's some things that came out recently that, that originated in, hey, if you could do this, it would be helpful. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think Federal Mogul is known in, in every line to be a problem solver and not just solving a problem, but making an installation easier as well. Federal Mogul Motor Parks' Garage Gurus is your go-to source for the vehicle training, technology, and answers you need to keep your next job on track. On site, online, or on demand, the gurus are here to help keep your business and your career on the road to success. Visit fmgarageguru.com. What else, guys? Uh, I love it. Quality control, uh, mentoring. What else can we basically kind of, you know, air quotes into a job description for a diagnostician? Well, one thing I enjoy doing was on downtime is uh, keeping up with our equipment, our tooling, making sure things are up to date, looking over cabling. Uh, you know, we have issues nowadays, again, to work on these vehicles. You need to be very computer savvy. You can make sure your Java is correct for whatever you're working on. Um, 
you know, you, you kind of fill in that IT role and you can maintain those things. You need to know them to work on cars nowadays. There's no way that you can't. Um, and I think also on top of that, you can go to maybe like a, a B-level tech if they're working on something. I guess it kind of goes with the mentoring thing, but you can fill in with diagnostics with the other guys uh, and kind of show them how would you go about a diagnostic process. Dave brought up in the podcast, I just listened to it and Brenna just listened to it. The tech that's going to be the diag tech is probably not going to be the grease monkey tech that they thought of. So just like Pedro was saying, it's probably going to be somebody that, especially in the future, it's going to be somebody that has some IT knowledge and has really good reading skills. You know, that was something that was brought up too. We have to be able to go in and not only read a wiring diagram, but read the uh, description and operation of how something works and then make heads or tails of it. And most of it's written in engineering terms anyways. So there's so much that is going to, you know, I guess change in a diagnostic text roles that need to be, you know, considered by the shop to not only just consider, I guess, their education, but also what they're putting forth. Not only are a lot of us putting a lot of time in at night towards, you know, getting better, but I also think it needs to be recognized to the amount of money that is being spent to keep up with training and things like that. You know? Could the diagnostician, the diag tech, or whatever we're you know we're calling him in this episode, or him or her, work with the owner um, and look at the the coordination of training for the shop? Yes, definitely. definitely. And the big thing that we run into a lot of times, at least that I'm seeing, and I know a lot of the guys in our group have seen the same thing, is that these shops. You know, I, I at least put on my cover letter, you know, the training events that I attend. And I tried to, you know, really explain that before I take a job that I'm very active in training. And they're always real excited about it. And then you get there and once they see the cost and the commitment, that flame that they had kind of burns out immediately. So I always end up paying for all my own training. And then they just kind of they think they want to be involved in it. And then they don't want to commit to it once they see what's involved. And I try really hard. I make sure they understand, you know, you're not only getting the training, but you're getting the networking out of it and the experience. And I really try to bring a lot back and explain that, but it's still sometimes, I guess, seems to fall on deaf ears. One thing that I really enjoy helping with, I'm not sure if uh, Tanner and Brent uh, agree, is write-ups. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, like a w- extended warranty, I enjoy communicating things clearly, getting it across, uh, so there's no miscommunications. Anytime we're dealing with something, uh, has to be very clearly expressed, even with customers. Uh, when I have to explain to a customer in detail, maybe someone that considers themselves a do-it-yourselfer, I really enjoy getting the point across in technical terms and clearly uh, so they get a very good understanding of what they're paying for. And then that helps the shop. You know, you bring somebody up front that... Uh, can appear to be educated and understands what they're doing very well. I mean, you're, that's going to look great for your shop. Dave brought it up too. Toyota right now is pushing their master techs to take classes on repair order writing. There's been some discussion about soft skills, uh, communication skills, getting along with people, being able to talk to a customer. You, you think those are important? Oh yeah, I think very it's much. hugely important. Yeah, for sure. Especially right now, as they say, the millennial generation and the generations coming up after that really want to understand what they're getting for their money. So somebody has to be able to explain to them what they're getting, why it's a value, why it's important to do the service. And they want to be taken care of and know that they're not being ripped off. And I think that that's something that the industry has struggled with and still kind of struggles with because the past, I guess, shops we're always kind of that rough and tough. And I've worked for a lot of owners that they don't want anything to do with talking to customers. And they'll tell you straight out when I talk to them, yeah, I hired this manager because I never wanted to talk to customers. Well, then you're kind of relying on a manager that hopefully knows something about cars. They may not know anything about cars to try to convey what's wrong with the car. And even if that manager has good soft skills, but they don't know anything about the car. And then that person turns around and goes to, you know, another technician that may have good soft skills and they go, well, they told me they replaced this part and this is how it was written up. And then that guy looks at it and goes, yeah, that part doesn't exist on a car. Then it makes that shop look bad. Any role for the diagnostician 
to work with the service advisor on systems? Uh, to, you know, who's going to help the service advisor stay current? Uh, maybe not to the degree, the nth degree, the geek degree that you are, but uh, if you will, the 10,000-foot the view of what you guys uh, are working on. Most definitely. I actively practice that. And anytime I would write something up that uh, involved maybe computer logic, I really enjoyed explaining it to the service writer and breaking it down and maybe into some simpler terms in a way that they could use as tooling for the customer. Uh, maybe they have a good understanding of it, but if, if I have a good understanding and break it down to the simplest form, that helps the service writer pass that on to the customer. And now they just learned the next three other uh, repairs that are similar, they're already tooled with the knowledge uh, to be able to pass that along. I try to help our service writer a lot, and I've tried to help a lot of owners and other managers through the years with explaining that to them. And I try to bring them out in the shop and show them what I'm doing so that they have a better understanding. I think it's kind of one of those things, too, that they should get involved. I believe when we go to these training conferences, we talk all the time about somebody should, you know, consider sending the whole shop if they can afford it and get the service writer not only in on service manager training, but I think it's a good idea to have them go and do some technical training too. You know, a basic electrical class would be good. A GDI class would be good. I just had this discussion with a shop about selling fuel induction services. They kind of always sell a fuel induction service with a tune-up, but I brought up that a lot of the new GDI cars, that fuel induction service really isn't doing a lot for it in the tests that we've seen. So as times change, you need to know the technology that's changing with it so that they understand what they're selling rather than selling it to somebody, a service that may no longer be needed or may no longer, you know, be something that's even being recommended anymore. So guys, the diagnostician, Pedro, you just started your own. And I've interviewed a lot of guys. Tanner, you want to do it. In, I just spoke to a, a shop owner that wants to take his best diagnostician and put him out on the road and take and do have run a mobile service out of his shop. Is it because we don't know how to manage and lead a diagnostician or we don't believe we have enough work for him? What's this phenom of mobile diagnostician all about? I think it's the hunger for the challenge, a lot of it. I, I think... Uh... I was in a great environment. I really enjoyed where I was. And I think it was the first uh, group of people referring to the shop owners that really looked for it. When I was approached about this job, they, they, you know, they uh, we went out to get some breakfast and we were talking about it. And they're like, we understand that a lot of this diagnostician part is an investment. You know, it doesn't bring out the most money in the shop. Uh, the suspension work, that's what brings the money. That's the reality, you know, turning wrenches, getting the work out, getting those hours. Uh, but the thing is, it's the reputation and the name that the shop gets. Now, the thing is, me personally, I, I have that hunger for a challenge. And I think anybody that does what I do is the same. And, and I kind of was looking for for a little bit more. Uh, and then I felt it was the right time. I've put the time in. Uh, I've been, you know, getting my things ready. And I felt that I could uh, command the type of jobs that I wanted uh, and feel that challenge and accomplishment that I'm really hungering for. I think one of the things that I've seen is not only do we all have a hunger to do it, but sometimes the shops definitely don't know how to manage it or keep it busy to have a diag tech. You know, I know Jeremy O'Neill has done a lot on selling diagnostics and that's something that I've worked in shops before that they've never sold diagnostic labor ever. They never charge for it. And then I come in and they believe that they have a need for a diagnostic tech. So they talk to me about it. And one of the shops that I worked at was this way. And I walked in and he was willing to change, but he was very uncomfortable selling diagnostics. So when I would spend two hours looking at a car, in all the years past, that was a wash to him. He was not ever charging for it. So getting them kind of on board and getting them to understand that I'm, you know, I may be your top paid guy or your diagnostic tech may be your top paid guy. Why are you letting them work for free? Getting them to kind of see that seems to be, uh, I guess, tough with some shops, I guess I would say. Bryn, you're the shop owner here. Um, do you have a diagnostic rate? We have started to um, take some of Jeremy's techniques and basically sell diagnostic packages. So um, the diagnostic rate does uh, 
come up because there's resources there that you will not be using in any other services that you offer. Uh, service information systems, uh, scan tools and updates for scan tools and training and things like that. So yes, uh, Jeremy O'Neill, uh, Tanner mentions great because I'm sure there's others out there, but I happen to know Jeremy pretty well. He's been on the show a lot. Uh, we talk about all the issues in the industries that like, you know, and what's the answer to fix them. It comes from every angle. I mean, it comes from your show. I mean, listening to your show and talking about these guys uh, and listening to these guys talk about that stuff and how to sell diagnostics property and, and hearing about guys like Jeremy and, and, you know, trying to motivate the shop owners and service advisors to attend that type of training. Part of the diagnostic technician in a brick and mortar facility, really, I think shop owners, you know, one thing is determining whether you need an A tech or a diagnostic tech. Part of this discussion is to try to determine whether or not you need a diagnostic tech. I personally think it doesn't take big staff model to, to, to support a diagnostic tech. But again, it goes into sharing with shop owners some of those other roles that a diagnostic tech can do as opposed to just diagnosing cars. Is there any special way, guys, that you need to schedule? How many vehicles a day can a diag? I mean, do you schedule six or seven? Uh, what do you do? That was my experience. I think, uh, you know, when you wouldn't have that one day that that car just totally kicked your butt uh, and set your back, you could efficiently take care of about five to six cars a day. Uh, if you always give yourself about two hours uh, per vehicle, usually you can get them some done in an hour, some done a little, sometimes a little longer, but it goes back to how to charge for it. Uh, if you get to the point where you have an initial charge of a diagnostic and it's an hour, I think once I get to my hour and a half mark, I would report to the service rider. Uh, I know this, I know this, but I don't know this. And it's going to require this much more time to learn these next few uh, bullet points. Uh, and then they call a customer and they express what they know. And you want to give as much information as possible. You get that right up. That's why communication is key. You don't want to call them and say, hey, we got two hours into it. We need two more hours. It's going to cost you this much. What do you know? He's still looking. That's not a good selling point. You want to know he knows that this is good. This is good. Uh, we know this is common and we want to attack this part. And that's mm -hmm. how you can efficiently sell it. And the customer will have a much better understanding and picture of what they're paying for. Well, that's for building value to that too. That's the other part of it. You know, selling diagnostics, if you're, you're selling something, people can't, you know, they don't really understand anything about it. So you have to put packages together and this goes, ties into the DVIs, you know, your shop management systems that have uh, ways that you can take pictures and screenshots of uh, scan tool captures and scope captures, upload those, and then do a quick story about what you found. And that's exactly right. You know, the communication is key up front. You're not selling a fixed car. You're selling testing to pinpoint the cause of their concern, basically. And you're kind of giving them a heads up of what they can expect, just like Pedro says. And if you have good uh, DBIs or something like that. That's again, it's about building value and that those types of things help you to build value, uh, telling those stories and, and attaching those stories with annotated screen captures of scan tool captures or scope captures. So I think right now, the biggest thing that we have to look at too, that was brought up is Pedro just said, you know, plan on two hours. What do we all know? We all see a lot of us came from flat rate an hour. Oh, it's got a communication issue. It's an hour. You know, the hour day to me is gone. And I think that's, it seems simple, but that's really the starting point of it is when you're scheduling work, you need to understand that cars are not the same as they were in 1980 and they're not the same as they were in 1990 or even in 2000. So judge, you know, taking your schedule and judging every single car that it's, the same as 1980 and it's going to take an hour to diagnose because it doesn't have spark and not understanding what's involved in it. These shops really need to understand that I would say two hours is probably pretty close to where you should be, you know, or where most cars are going to take you if they're a hard diagnostic problem. It was you Pedro that said five to six at two hours a piece. That's a long day. Oh, no, it is definitely. And again, you know, there could be days where I only got two cars in and then um, four cars had to get carried over. Okay, so you're the you're the diagnostic tech. You've had two cars a day. Is the owner just going crazy that he's paying you to be there? You know, there's there's nothing that's high tech coming in. I'll be honest with you that I never experienced that directly. Uh, usually there was good understanding. Uh, I think there was frustration over the, the numbers. The numbers have to make sense. Uh, but I think they, they always take the bad with the good. 
and, and there was an understanding of that. And I love what you guys started out this whole show with. There's there's work that the diagnostician can do uh, as as a very major lead inside the business. And I don't want to re- rehash that; it'll be in the show notes. But uh, those those are great pointers, and and I like where this this conversation is going. A thought that I have is I've got this this image of a tech over here, and I have this image of diagnostic tech over here. Are they one of the same? Are they different in certain shops? Do they blend together? Help me understand it. Are they north, south? How does it work? I, I don't think they're the same. I, I really, I think I had a couple of ATOX that I worked with, you know, excellent technicians. And this was your all around guy. You know, he could knock out real, you know, heavy mechanical work. He could grab a scan tool and, and get to an area of a problem. At least tell me, hey, I know this is a fuel related problem. It's not fuel related. You know, this could be something that's to a component failure or electrical uh, circuitry. That's a technician that can tackle a lot of the jobs. And if you work together, I mean, that job, that shop is going to produce. Uh, he can get a, a starting point and maybe knock out half of the jobs that are going to be just maybe routine repairs. And anything that's heavier, he updates you on when he knows the vehicle moves on to you, along with that extra diagnostic time that was charged. Yeah. So they complement each other. Yeah, maybe yeah. do kind of that triage thing that Chris Chesney talks about or uh, Jim Morton talks about the funnels. You know, maybe that ATEC can kind of give a rough idea where, yeah. Diagnostician is going to do any of the mechanical work. He discovers a problem and someone's got to get in there and, you know, play Dr. Wrench. Is he going to do that or move on to the next vehicle? Quick stuff that's easy, you know, uh, that doesn't need a whole lot of invasive repair. I think, you know, solenoids that are really easy. What do you guys think? Wiring repair? I think that's pretty typical. Well, I always did the wiring repairs. Um, yeah. If I found a wiring issue, that was always me. And it's a good thing you asked that, Carm, because one of my weaknesses is engine internals. I have focused so much on maybe the drivability portion and understanding electrical that when I get in there, sometimes I really, really need to get educated on how a mechanical component works. And that can play against you. You know, we talk about a great diagnostician, being able to use all this electronics. Thing is, you need to have a strong mechanical background to tie it all together. I love what you're saying is you don't have to be strong in mechanical to be a great diagnostician. And I guess it goes to the fact that can you be that world class in everything that's thrown at you today? I don't think so. It's impossible. It it really is. You know, I had the help of great, great, you know, heavy line guys that could really break it down. You know, I had this uh, a vehicle that had some problems with some timing chains and I knew there was an issue with the timing but I couldn't tie it all together without really understanding it. Once the vehicle was tore down, I got the visual and it made sense. But if you don't understand what's going on inside, you only know so much. So you really need to have an understanding of both. I don't think you can excel in both, uh, but you need to stay updated and be involved. You can't just plug in the scanner, use your scope, say, oh, your cam and crank sync are off, pass it to the next guy. That's not going to be an efficient repair. You kind of have to be able to separate the two, I guess, as far as what they're doing for diagnostics and if they're doing mechanical. Because I, for years, did nothing but heavy line work, all engine internal stuff. I worked for a real large uh, diesel company and did nothing but diesel engine repair for about a year and a half or so. Um, Worked for a large towing company and did the same thing there on big trucks too. And you'll never be really efficient at diagnostic work and the scan tools stuff that's out there nowadays, even just knowing and understanding the factory software, knowing to go onto the NASTEF site and find, you know, the service information like Pedro and I were talking about, you know, when you (laughs) caught us talking about all our geek stuff earlier, it takes a lot just to know to go on the NASTEF site and find the right Resource oh, manufacturer site, like, yeah, yeah, and figure out how to sign into them and pay for them and get them if you're using the factory uh, scan tool to get that booted up on your laptop. So, the idea behind somebody doing really, really, really good mechanical work and really, really, really good diagnostic work, I think years ago was definitely doable. You know, and I think that's where you see a lot of owners and other people say, you know, oh, well, when I was younger and I was a tech and I could do all of it. Well, in the 1980s, there wasn't a whole lot around, you know, 1980s, 1990s, you had a snap on brick was the most common and that was pretty much it. Do it all. 
yeah, everything was pretty simple as far as what you were using to diagnose vehicles. So each vehicle has gotten so different from one another that to be able to do both, in my opinion, I was really asking a lot. Well, you need to get a team together. You know, as, as you're explaining all of this, it's really, you need a team with all the right roles being filled. If you want to get a diagnostic technician, as we're on this subject, you got to have a good heavy line guy. You got to have a good A tech, a B tech, and all of these guys have to complement each other. If you have a diagnostic tech come in and everybody resents him because he's not doing any of the heavy work, that's a formula for failure. It's, it's not going to work. Again, if I have a misunderstanding on a mechanical function or an internal uh, component, I can't be scared to go ask you know, the heavy line guy how this works and explain it to me because he does have a lot to teach me. And I have to be understanding of that and humble enough to be aware of that. And I might have something to offer in return. Uh, but if you get a diagn- diagnostician come in and he can't work with the other guys, it, it's not going to work. Why is that, guys? Uh, gotta have, gotta swallow your pride and learn yes. from other people. Well, the leadership of the shop has to, you know, set the roles, the importance of the roles. I mean, I always look to culture and I always look to leadership when stuff like that doesn't doesn't work, and and, and you can't let it go too far, you know, off the deep end of the pool. If not, you're gonna have a really fragmented workforce. Yeah, for sure. No one working together is not good. I can't imagine the quality problems. I can't imagine the attitudes. Uh, oh God, let's not go there. Oh. Yeah, the culture has got to be right. Yeah, but you bring up sure. a great point, Pedro, and I'm so glad you said it because we now we got it on audio record, right? We, we've got it out there. And if anyone is finding a problem, all we'll just tell them is go listen to that episode and, you know, and, and understand what's, what's going on. Guys, uh, a typical day of a diagnostician, you know, the kind of the must do's. Yeah, you've got say you got only two vehicles for the day. <laughs> what are the, what are the must do's that you guys are going to go through? When that happened to me, I had a, uh, maybe it's a bad habit, but I would really take my time, you know, within reason to not affect the customer. I felt like a drop off and I would record a lot of non good data. I'd maybe create faults and try to record it. Uh, so you never saw me just standing around. That was never something that I enjoyed doing anyway. So if I knew I had like a 2016 vehicle, had a simple issue with, I don't know, EVAP or just something that was a quick diagnostic, I would make the best of it. At the end of the day, that shop's going to win. The next vehicle that comes in and I have all that data saved, guess what? We're going to go through it a lot faster, hopefully. That's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, I think you're kind of like Pedro said, even when I'm not collecting known goods on late model cars, because down here in the southeast, we don't have rust, so we don't get as many late (laughs) model cars. But um, collecting scan data and scope captures on known goods is definitely important. But you you typically... You know, most of us too are, are looking at long term, and and some of us are, you know, Paige is already teaching uh, fairly frequently, I believe, but teaching and, and and teaching some of our own materials, so collecting case studies and and putting them in a, a teachable manner, like in a PowerPoint or whatever, and annotating screen, you know, scan and scope captures are part of it. But as far as the company is concerned. Um, I think Pedro uh, can probably speak to that as well, pretty well. But you know, what you're when you're have a light day. What are some of the things that you're doing for the shop uh, that maybe the shop owner is not necessarily aware of, I guess, or doesn't think about? That's something I want to bring up, too. Not only the things that we're doing to stay busy, sweeping the floor, cleaning the shop, case studies, known goods, you know, everything we're doing. But when that owner turns around and sees that you only did two cars, it's pushed so much in the management side of every tech has to have X amount of hours for the week. Well, then that puts us as a diag tech in a bad position because then they come back and they're like, well, you know, you didn't make any hours for the week. And I struggle sometimes to explain that. And I kind of look at them and try to, I guess, as politely as I can explain, this is what you hired me for. Do you want me to do other things? But a lot of times they don't really know what else to do and where the hours should be. And uh, they don't quite understand, I guess, how it's supposed to run. This, this makes me think of a first-time parent. You know, yeah. you get your first child and you're kind of learning along with them. And yep. that's really what it is. You get your diagnostic tech. You're both learning how to how to do this together. Uh, no so when you when you leave and he hires an X one, it's easier. I right? get yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you learned a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, that goes into you trying to do, to help shops realize whether or not they have the car count or the needs for a diagnostic technician. And, um, you know, a lot of it, it's no different than marketing for 
you know, if you decide you want a diagnostic technician, it's, it's no different than marketing for, you know, maintenance work or alignment work or break work. You just, you decide you want a diagnostic technician. You need to market for that too, whether it be for you know, car lots or other shops in the area. So that's something that um, shop owners need to recognize is that, you know, they've got to, they got to go for it. They've got to ask for that business. So Bryn, um, I'm a customer. And I'm, I'm having my check engine lights on and I'm coming in. The car doesn't run well. And I come into your place. Does a shop have to have a diagnostician today or they can just pick up the phone and hire Pedro in those small few instances until they grow their their volume? I, I, and the other point is I want to come to you. I trust you. I'm you're my shop. I'm your ideal customer. So so here I am. Fix it, Bryn. Right. So that's the thing as a shop. Yeah, exactly. It's a great point. As a shop, you have to realize whether or not you have the volume of cars that need a diagnostic technician. And if you don't, hopefully you're fortunate enough in an area like uh, Pedro's area, there's a lot of, um, there's enough shops there that would support a mobile diagnostic technician. So not every area or region has got a mobile diagnostic technician. So if you do, if you're fortunate to have that, then that's something that that's another option. You don't have to necessarily try to to handle that yourself, you know, because it's a risk of a return on investment being bad. Basically, is the amount of time that you invest in tooling to fix everything that comes in uh, on a high level diagnostic type thing. Um, it's a, it's pretty substantial. So you have to determine, you know, again whether that's something that your shop can support car volume wise. And if you have that option, great, but. Well, it's, it's a goal, I think. You know, it, it could be part of your business plan to develop that. Uh, like Carm said, you, you only need to call it a mobile tech, you know, every few months. But let's say you start promoting yourself to do so and you start subletting with other shops uh, and you get that uh, reputation that you can handle these diagnostic jobs. You want to be that shop that handles all the diag. Uh, sure, you might start off by calling a mobile guy, you know, maybe five times a week. But guess what? Once you have that volume come in, now your business plan is in motion, and then you hire your diagnostic tech. Now my, you have the car count to maintain it. Yeah. In my opinion, I definitely don't think they do. I mean, that's where the need for a mobile guy comes in. I think what the shops really need to do is sit down when they're thinking about hiring is listen to some of these podcasts and talk to some management trainers and really look at and say, what am I looking for when I'm hiring a technician? Because a lot of these shops see a diagnostic tech and they get all giddy and they're real excited. But then you sit down and interview with them and talk to them and go, okay, what are you looking to have done? You know, what are you, what are my roles going to be? How many check engine lights do you have? What do you want done? They're like, oh, we do a lot of brakes. We got do a lot of tires. Really need, to, you know, somebody that can bang that stuff out. But we need a diag tech too. Well, if you were doing 10 cars a day that have brakes and tires and maybe one or two cars a week with a check engine light, you really don't have a need for a diag tech. And it would be, I don't want to say a waste of your money, but your money would be better spent hiring somebody that's going to cost you less money to do those things. Yeah. I mean, like, again, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have a mobile guy in there um, or if you have another shop that has that reputation, that's already built that business, then you can sublet that to the other shop. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I know in New York where I was and I know in Carm's area too, there really isn't any diagnostic techs and the weather kind of prevents it. And that was one of the reasons why I just relocated so that I could have the opportunity to go out and be mobile because it would have been impossible in the Northeastern winters. But, I chose an area that there was no other diag tech. But wait a minute, uh, mobile repair is different than mobile diagnostics. So aren't they going to invite you into the shop to do that work in the winter, Tanner? Most of the time. <laughs> you would hope so. But what I saw in New York was a lot of smaller, older shops. So they don't have a lot of bays. So the shops that I did kind of help at night, things that I would go look at, friends of mine, it was always, yeah, we'll get it inside for you. And then I'd get there and they'd have had a problem car that they couldn't get parts for. So then the car ended up out in the parking Don't lot. Don't forget the dead battery out there too. Exactly. Flat tire. So I knew what would happen if I tried it in New York. So that was kind of why I Okay, moved. so there, there isn't a point in time in your business model that you could say, the car must be inside. Yes, 
for sure you try but it, you know a lot of shops don't have the room for it and it's you're, yeah. you're looking to get the work done uh and, get, and gain the customer you know I, i'm in the midwest we got some pretty rough winters i don't think i would be outside in a snowstorm or rain you might have to look at something outside maybe a, a check engine light or something quick under the hood this has been so enlightening um i think we've covered so many uh, great areas uh, it, we were focused but we went wide in the discussion uh, in, in this focus so an a tech to you guys is not a diagnostic tech that's the big takeaway here i, I talked to shop was yeah i gotta hire an a tech a tech i guess what i have to do in the future is to say are you looking for this person to be a real good diag or a really good top level me- mechanical tech Pretty much, just like Pedro described, as an A tech is somebody that can, is well rounded, can, has a lot of experience, can kind of handle most of what comes into the shop, including basic level diagnostic. And then every once in a while, he might have to uh, pull on a, another resource or somebody like Pedro to get in there and help him figure something out. So you got an eight bay place, uh, you probably can afford to bring a, a, a diagnostic tech in, and you'll probably have the work for that person. But a, a two, three bay place, maybe not. Unless you've built that reputation with other shops, typically. I mean, you're not going to get a lot of customer pay work that's going to keep you that busy. It's going to have to be like a sublet scenario, I think. What else you you guys want to get off your minds? I guess one thing that I noticed the other day, just to touch on the difference of an A-tech and a diagnostic tech, the new science and technology school uh, out in Colorado, yeah. I, saw, I saw in his video that he made i showed everyone in the shop this to see their opinion he has the diagnostic techs in the engineering department and skilled trade and mechanical are a completely different department so everybody's kind of understanding and dave touched on it too that the kids that are going to go into the diag side are not the kids that are going to go into the mechanical side by the way guys thanks for that connection i saw that and i immediately reached out to do an interview on that and i was told hey uh carm give us a two or three more weeks we're working on a few things so we we will work hard to get that done so tell me tanner pedro Bryn, ultimate goals is training and i know you guys are doing training now Set me up. What, what what do you want to, you know, okay, you're diagnostic techs. Bryn, you're a diagnostic geek and a shop owner, but you're also doing some training and some writing. Yeah, I think if you were to ask all of us, you probably may as well just ask one of us because it's very similar. I mean, we're uh, automotive technology and diagnostics is the primary piece, but most diagnostic technicians, true diagnostic technicians, I think they get a thrill from being able to uh, you've seen, heard a lot of trainers on your show say it. You, know, you see that light bulb go out for another technician when you're explaining something. So I think most diagnostic techni- technicians really appreciate being able to share their their knowledge and being able to help other people's uh, other diagnostic techs or other technicians that are aspiring to be diagnostic technicians kind of get there, whether it's an A tech or whatever you want to call it. I mean, is helping them make you know understand something is great. So I think. For sure, it's the it's diagnostics, it's training, and for me, you know, uh, you already know this. It's it's a big time passion for helping the industry move in a forward, positive direction. So, you know, one, one big goal that I have is, and maybe this is a stretch, but you know, as we move forward with uh, trade schools, focusing more on maybe diagnostic roles uh, than just a mechanical focus or general training is setting up some kind of mentoring program. If you have a select group in your class that's looking to really move into the diagnostic side of things is uh, have a reputable shop or technician. Let's say I, I can work with a school where once a week I get one of these students to ride with me for the whole day. That, that would be something that I would really enjoy because I can share my knowledge. They can see the workflow of the day and the challenges and see the real world and what's out there. You're not just in the shop, you know, with mechanical pulling plugs and this and that. A lot of it is very, very tech savvy and, and you can really experience it. If, if we can get like you made a, a connection with a medical field with like a general practitioner and maybe a surgeon. Uh, same thing. If you can connect the student to come out and see that they want to specialize in diagnostics, you can get that role filled in by coming out and getting all your hands involved with all this technical information. Are you training for any special company, Pedro? Uh, drivability guys uh, with Scott Shine and Eric Ziegler. Yeah, perfect. Great. Oh, God. Yeah. Great, great people. Tanner, how about you? 
my big goal is I'd like to teach and I'd like to be a little bit more involved on that end of it with high schools as well as colleges. I really see a need to try to help guidance counselors and the college directors make it a point to find the kids that they really want in the program. Amen. That's something that to me is, you know, I saw it for the last three years I've gone and uh, proctored the NACTI test in New York for one of the local high schools up there. And a lot of times they got sent kids that the school wasn't sure what to do with. They just didn't have a drive for something. So they were sent there and not only are they doing something that they don't want to do, but then that's not helping the industry at all. So I'd like to continue to become a better diagnostic tech and really try to get involved more with helping the industry and bringing on the technicians. And then also on the end of after the college is done with them, making sure that those kids are treated correctly and stay in the industry. Heck yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, you know what? You, you've just almost opened up my whole eyes that we almost need some post-secondary graduate yes. post-management, if you will. <laughs> yes. Oh, by the way, you're leaving. I, I don't care where you're going. Dealership, independent, doesn't matter. By the way, we've assigned this guy, Tanner, to you. And he's going to check in with you every three weeks. It'd be like they were on probation, right? Mm, yeah. Oh, where am I? Here's what I... Because we're, we're losing, you know, a couple of years in, this, this, some disenchantment of, you know, trying to figure out how flat rate works and, and some other job issues they may have not found like you guys mentioned in the early in the early segment here they're, they're not challenged enough i think those are both brilliant like pedro's thoughts and, and tanner's as well um but you know th there's so many shops that are looking for talent and they're calling the daves and the matt shanahan's and the you know and they're calling them asking them you know i think that would be great is okay, you know, if you want us to feed you, you know, some of our best uh, graduates, then you have to be held accountable. You have to teach, treat these people right. You know, it's not necessarily the technician so much that needs the follow-up. It's okay. You talk to that technician, how they've been treating you, you know, what, what have they have, have you been doing? It's, it's a great idea. You offer them a manifesto and this is really, this is kind of how the integration of, of our new student works inside of your business. And by the way, we're going to, we're going to send Tanner and to check you out every, every three months to be sure it's happening because we're, we're looking for insurance. I mean, you know, the, the money doesn't come back to the school if the graduate graduation rates 20 percent and then and then 50 percent fall out after two years once the once they're in the job market. Definitely. You know, I lost my train of thought earlier. What I was trying to get across when you had made the reference to the medical field is uh, when somebody's going going to go out to the medical field, they do something called like clinical hours. You know, they get out there, they have to book a certain amount of hours in the field. That's what I was trying to allude, allude to earlier, is if that's really a career you're going to go into, like you said, the, the tanner has to check in with them, you know, every three weeks. Uh, same thing, you have to get 60 hours in a shop with somebody that does the type of work you're interested in. Is this really what's going to work for you? And if this is what you want, you have to complete this. One, you get out there with some experience, you, you dip your toes in the water, uh, and it gives you a better idea, do I really want to do this for the next 10, 15 years of my life? Is this pie in the sky? Are we just talking, or do you think this could actually happen? I think that I think would be great. It's easy. It's not hard. I, I think it needs to happen. And something to bring up, when I heard Dave bring up talking to dealerships about you know people moving and about how they get the data, he brought up some of the Toyota stuff. I was a Toyota T10 graduate. I got a call six months after I graduated from Toyota, and they asked if I was still at my dealership, and I was not. Uh, I didn't stay at the dealership because they lowballed me as soon as I graduated, basically made me such a bad offer that I would not have even been able to afford the gas to drive there, let alone any type of expense after that. Why would they be spending this kind of money on these programs at these post-secondary schools and, and, and lowball you? You're a pretty smart kid. I mean, they had to see that. And not only lowball us, but the flat rate thing. You know, We talk about the medical field. I have tons of kids that I graduated with. I was luckily smart in high school. I don't know what happened after that, but <laughs> all the kids that I was in classes with are now engineers, scientists, doctors. I have one that's a brain surgeon. They all came out of their field, were respected when they graduated, and were made a good offer so that they could pay off their student loans. And not only made an offer, but made an offer to where they knew – this week, I'm going to have this amount of money. The next week, I'm going to have the same amount of money. Whereas 
the kids coming out of the field today are not only probably going to get lowballed at a dealership and get told, I guess I'll throw a number out there. They're going to graduate with, say, at some of these colleges, anywhere from $30,000 to $60,000 in debt. And the college is going to offer them 15 to 18 bucks an hour flat rate and can't guarantee them any hours. So they might make three or 400 bucks and they've got 60 grand in school debt and they're supposed to spend 10 to 15 grand in tools over the next, you know, from the time they start college to the time that they're done. It's ridiculous. And that's why I don't think that we can keep any until we see that change. And the manufacturers are getting involved as Dave brought up in these colleges, but they still don't want to do anything to change their business model to keep the kids. And that's why we all need to get involved with the, uh, with the advisory councils. Um, I, I joined our, our local and I am so glad I did. I've learned so much and I really think I'm, I'm contributing uh, in, in a very big way. I, I, there's some great things going on at our school and, 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 you know, we're writing this five-year vision plan and I love, I love what's going on. So thank you so much, Bryn Klein from Assured Auto Works, Tanner Brandt from Tanner's Auto Clinic, and Pedro Delatore from Logic Automotive. Will you guys come back? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Cool. Looking forward. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Carm. Thanks, Bryn Klein, Tanner Brandt, and Pedro Delatore. Wow, your passion showed through. And thanks for creating an excellent podcast resource for the industry to enjoy over and over again. Powerful messages for shop owners, service advisors, and of course, technicians. Continued success to you. Thanks for sharing your key analysis toward the technician and diagnosticians in our industry today. Find the key talking points and additional bio information on Bryn, Tanner, and Pedro at remarkableresults.biz slash E344. Hey, tell a friend how much you value Remarkable Results Radio. I'd appreciate a shout out and even a share. Hey, thanks and talk soon. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. 